Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Today I'm going to be reviewing the NIP Embedded Systems Professional Laptop Battery Analyzer. So um, I'll go through various features of this thing, including what it is, what it does, what it can be used for, and why it's a very powerful bit of equipment in the right hands. So firstly, quick summary of what this is. Um, if we take an example of any typical laptop battery, here's a HP laptop battery here. Um, as you can see, it's got this weird connector on it, um, which is kind of proprietary and kind of not. Um, and what this guy can do is it connects up to this connector and it talks to the controller inside this battery and it can then display it through the software all the back all the parameters of the battery including uh, how many cycles it's done its maximum and minimum capacities the serial number when it was made the overall health of the battery the health of the cells inside the battery and lots and lots of information like this which is incredibly valuable when you need to find out whether a battery is actually any good or not it can be used to tell you if the battery should be replaced if the battery is repairable or if the battery can be recovered by doing uh, calibration and so on and so forth. You could also use it effectively to um, review batteries by performing charge and discharge checks to see if it actually meets its claimed specification. So the way it does this is by connecting through this Phoenix connector on the front. Um, I've got a couple of examples here. This wiring harness comes with the device. Um, and we've got the four pin Phoenix connector going to these breakout spades. And these spades are designed specifically to pl plug into these connectors. So as you can see, you can just slip, stick that into the slot there. Um, and you can just wire up to whatever the pinout of the battery you're using is. And the software that comes with this device specifically has pinouts for all common laptop batteries. And we'll go over that in a moment and it can show you how to connect this thing up so you don't need to know the pinout of the battery in advance. And that's extremely handy because these pinouts are not standardized. There are patterns to them. You know, for example, you'll typically have a couple of positives, a couple of negatives, and then you clock and data somewhere in the middle and things like that. However, the exact pinout varies dramatically. So here's another example one here. Um, using the extra Phoenix connectors and uh, pin pitch adapters that come with the device, I've made up this harness for a MacBook Air battery. Um, so once again, we've got a couple of positives. We've got our clock pin, our data pin, and our ground pin. Now, if you're wondering what this guy is doing here, this is the battery enable wire. And in a MacBook Air, the battery enable wire is tied to ground with a 10K resistor, which is why I've added one of those in. However, I'm told by NIP that this isn't actually necessary. Um, I was evaluating this device on a slightly older version of the software. However, the latest version of the software, version 3, that came out literally today as I started recording this, uh, now includes the, that pinout functionality. So now, using those pinouts, I don't need to look this up anymore, and I can just go with whatever pinouts that the battery analyzer software tells me to use, and that'll work just fine. So now with this uh, with this wiring harness, I can just disconnect this and hook it up to any other MacBook Air battery. So I can have a couple of common harnesses for batteries that I regularly see, like MacBook batteries, and then we've got this guy, which is kind of a universal harness for basically everything else. So as well as the Phoenix connector on the front, we've got power LED and then we've got an output LED. So power LED is power to the battery analyzer. And then the output LED, this guy lights up when the battery is outputting voltage into the device. So this is useful because as I mentioned, a lot of batteries have an enable pin. Um, and if that enable pin is not set correctly, the battery will not output any voltage, which means you can't charge or discharge it. However, even if it's not outputting, you can still talk to the controller over the data lines. So if your battery is not outputting and you don't know why, you can actually communicate with the battery to determine why it is not outputting. So this is really helpful if you've got a battery that you're trying to recover because it might actually give you a clue as to what has happened to it. So on the back of the device, we've got a USB 2 interface. We've got a, uh, a 19 to 20 volt 3 amp input. The device came with a 65 watt power adapter that was made by Delta Electronics. So it came with a high quality power supply as well. And then finally, you can see through the back vent there, we've got a cooling fan for the big heatsink inside for the power transistor that handles charging and discharging. 
The actual internals of the device are not hugely exciting. As I mentioned, it's got a, a battery charger and discharger um, circuit in there. Um, however, the rest of it is mainly just uh, serial interface control circuitry and protection circuitry. If you're concerned about having just this Phoenix connector and having to make up your own wiring harnesses and stuff like that, don't worry, this thing all has protection circuitry in it. So if something is wired up incorrectly, it can actually successfully arrest any faults. So not a big deal at all. And because the software includes that pinout feature that shows you how to connect it all up, it takes all the guesswork out of it for you. So let's hook this up to a computer and I'll show it to you in action. Okay, so I've got the software loaded up here. And once we connect to the device, it will enable the interface. And this might look a little bit intimidating at first blush because there's a lot of parameters here that we can read off from our battery. However, this will make more sense as we go. The first thing we need to do is actually get our battery connected up. So to do this, I'm gonna look up the battery pinout for this thing. So what I've got here is I've got a LaVolta battery. This is a replacement on a HP. It says it replaces MU06, MU09, and so on and so forth. So let's go to the battery pinout section here and let's go HP, and I'm going to search MU06, find pinout. So that's told us it's an 8-pin connector, and it's given us this code here, which is the pinout. So that is plus 1, D3, C4, minus 8. And we can use the legend over here to figure out what that means. So in this case, plus 1 means pin 1 is our positive pin, or VBAT. Then D3 means pin pin 3 is data, C4 means pin 4 is clock, and then minus 8 means that pin 8 is our minus or ground pin. Then in addition to that, on certain batteries, as I mentioned earlier on, you may also have a T pin which indicates system present, and we just tie that to a ground connector. So let's hook up our battery. So as per the pinout diagram, I'm going to start from um, I'm going to start from ground and work backwards. So let's grab a ground wire, and we're going to go pin eight ground. Then I'm going to go pin four for clock. So eight seven six five four. Then pin three for data. and then pin one for positive. As you can see, we've got an output LED to indicate that the battery is outputting now. So what we'll do now is let's go back to the software and I'll hit start reading to just start pulling data from the battery. There we go. And as you can see, it's now pulled all of this information. So let's just stop reading because we've got the information there. And as you can see, we've got um, remaining power, uh, we've got current charge rates, time to full, time to empty, temperature, voltage, current, average current, remaining capacity, and all of this stuff. The cycle count down here, it seems this battery has only done 151 cycles, so it should be in reasonably good health. So we've now confirmed that we are reading from the battery. So let's hit read capacity down here. And as you can see, this battery is reading at 97% full. So apparently it's fully charged. Now that's correct, because I've actually had this battery connected to a laptop on charge for a laptop that is just in my spares box. So this, this looks good. So let's try just doing compute health. And it's going to do just a very rough check to guess what condition this battery is in. So apparently this battery is in pretty good nick. It's at 88% health. So our very rough just off the cuff checks say that it's pretty good. We've also got other static data here. If we read static data, we can also see the design capacity. So how much it's supposed to store, what the voltage should be, uh, manufacturing date, it was made in 2016. So despite the fact that it's only done 151 cycles, it's actually quite an old battery. So it probably sat on a shelf for a while. And then we've also got manufacturing codes, a serial number and so on and so forth. That's pretty good. So what else can we do with this now? Well, what I'll do, let's just go across the tabs one by one. So over here, we've got the charge tab, and this will do a controlled charge on the battery. Then we can do a controlled discharge. And because the battery is full, I'll show you the discharge in action. So let's just go, we're going to do a two amp discharge current, and we'll start discharging. 
off it goes. So as you can see, we've now got a, the graph is automatically plotting and it's showing the total battery voltage and the cell voltage as well. And so we've also got battery current as well. So we can follow these graphs across and that gives us data showing us the discharge characteristics of the battery. So this might be interesting because we can see if the, uh, the cells are discharging evenly or unevenly and so on and so forth. You can see at the moment that initially this, the cell voltages have drooped where we've suddenly applied a load on it. However, now it's every, all stabilized. We just see, should see just a long trail off there until the battery is empty. And we can specify in these boxes how low we want that to go. So if we want to, we can just say, just take it down to say half the, the discharge by dropping it down to say 3.4, 3.5 volts per cell or something like that. So that's our discharge. Then over in auto cycle calibrate, what we can do here is we can calibrate the battery by setting up a discharge and charge cycle. And we can tell it to do that several times if we want to. So we can auto cycle it and just hammer the battery by discharge and charging it several times over just to make sure that it's operating at normal rates. And it will tell us what the capacity was before and what the capacity was after so we can see if we gained or lost capacity by actually cycling the battery a few times. Over on the repair tab, this allows us to study the cell configuration of the battery and check what health the cells are in. So I believe that we can just straight up, if we run read battery configuration, it will reorder this to the cell configuration of the battery. We've got a three cell battery here, so nothing will change there. But if we had a two or a four cell battery, this, this would update when we hit read battery configuration to display two or four cells as respective. So we can click check wrong cells and what it will do is it will do a resistance check on the cells to check what resistance they are showing and this will give us a rough idea on whether the cells are in good condition or not. Okay well that's interesting so what we're seeing here is apparently we've got three poor cells they're all reading reasonably high resistance so this may, indicative, this may be indicative of the fact that it's a third party battery and also it did say it was a 2016 battery. So despite the low, the low charge cycle count, the battery is getting old where it's well, a four year old battery. So that shows that this battery might not be as good as we think it is. We can also do wake up the battery where it will do a little bit of a charge and discharge cycle on the battery to get it going. However, because the battery is currently at 100%, this one won't allow me to do that. So we'd have to discharge the battery a little way before we do this. So over on the device control tab, this is mainly situated with the battery analyzer device itself. And this allows us to calibrate the device and also run tests on the device. And also one particularly useful feature it has is just an output voltage. And what this will do is that if you have a stone dead battery that won't talk to anyone because it's completely dead, you can actually forcibly start trickle charging the battery at just a little bit of voltage, just to nudge the voltage of the battery up to the point where it suddenly becomes responsive. And I'll actually run a test on that in a minute with some of the dead batteries that I've got to hand here. Um, a couple of these batteries, I could get nothing out of them whatsoever. So I'm going to try feeding a bit of voltage into them just to see if we can recover the batteries and get them talking. Then over here on the test tab, what we can do here is do a systematic test of the battery, just an overall health check, which will produce an actual PDF report of the battery test. So this is particularly useful if you're running a, sh a repair shop or any kind of lab where you actually need to provide quantifiable results for someone else to look at, such as a client or another, another division of the company or something like that. So as you can see here, I've just filled out some dummy information on my test lab laboratory and we can specify what tests we want to do. So communication, charging, discharge, temperature, health and cycle count. And we can also specify what our grounds for this test is. So we can say in order to pass, we expect the health to be at least 70% and the cycle count to be less than 600. And we can also specify how long we want the discharge and charge test to be. So you could say, no, I want to do a deep test of the battery. I want to take that battery down to 30% and then charge it in order to properly test it. So you can spec specify exactly what you want here. We can also say what the date and the test ID will be and where it's going to save the report to. So let's go ahead and run that test 
on this Lavolta battery. So I'm going to hit run test. So it's ramping up and now these test logs will start spitting out information as it goes through the test sections. There we go and as you can see the test has passed as per our requirements so let's go ahead and save a PDF report of that and I'll just show you what that PDF report looks like if I open that up. And as you can see it's giving us a nice formatted PDF with what tests were conducted, what conditions they were conducted under and what the results were and then you can print that off, give it a signature and hand that off to your superior or your client. So really nicely presented here. This is one of my favorite features of this device by a long shot because um, when people actually want reports on stuff, it's very difficult to actually do that. You often end up either having to screen cap something or just write down the results yourself. So having something that will actually spit out a nice formatted report for you, very, very handy indeed. So that's the test functionality. Then over on the reset tab here, this gives us the ability to write information back to the battery controller. Now, this requires certain um, this requires certain battery controllers to be present to do so. And at the moment, this is a fairly new feature. As you can see, our chip selection is quite limited at the moment. However, this is a feature that I expect to, to be expanded in the future on this device. And it will be particularly helpful because if you've actually conducted repairs to a battery, such as replaced cells, or if you fixed a fault that was with the battery and thus the battery is now logged an issue that is no longer present, you can then send data back to the battery and say, this fault has now been cleared. You can now operate normally. So this is a feature that I think will come more into its own in the future, but at the moment only works on a limited set of battery controllers. So now let's run through all of this again with another battery that's probably in much poorer condition. So I'm just going to clear all this data. I'm just going to clear all this just to clear. We can't clear these bars, but we'll run through those again in a minute. And I will take my new battery for test. So this is another MacBook Air battery that I've got to one hand. This one's got, I've written old but works on this one. So we'll see how, we'll see how much that holds up, right? See, that's the thing. I know this works, but I've no idea what condition it's in. You know, could this actually still be useful if I was to stick it in a second-hand laptop? Who knows? So I'm going to plug in my MacBook Air wiring harness here. And plug that into the front. Cool. We have output. Good start. And let's check if we can read the battery. Nice. Looks good. We have information. So straight away, you can see that this battery has done 972 cycles. So this guy's seen a lot more action. Let's check the capacity. So this is sitting down at 19%. It's not completely flat, but it's pretty well down. And what does it say the health is? The health apparently is pretty good. It's at 78%. So, you know, this one, this guy has seen a lot of, this guy has seen a lot of cycles. However, apparently it's actually an overall reasonable health. So let's see how well this holds up. Uh, so what I'll do, I'm going to go over to the repair tab first, and we're just going to get some more information from here. So let's read configuration. And as you can see, that's dropped to two cells because this is a two cell battery. And we'll check wrong cells. Oh dear, <laughs> the cells are uh, pretty high impedance. So yeah, it's the health seems reasonably good. However, don't know how much I'd trust those cells. See, this is the interesting thing that the reported health percentage is not always a great indicator on how good the battery is. But eh, let's see how we do first. So uh, what we'll do is I'm going to try doing a calibrate test on this and we'll see what it can do. So I'm going to run all of this just at the default value. So let's just hit start calibration. So this is now charging the battery up and it's going to charge the battery up and then it's going to discharge it and measure how much power it gave on the discharge cycle. And from there, it can calculate the capacity after and we can just double check what the current state of the battery is in. Now, doing a calibrate cycle, this may give us a better or worse result we may get an improved result because we've cycled the battery and reinvigorated the chemical, the chemistry of the battery. 
However, we might also find that the health goes down because what we've actually done is charge and discharge it and discovered that the cells are actually in much worse condition than the controller last knew because the controller only has what information it last measured. So this is going to take quite a long time to run because we've got to do a full charge and then discharge. So I'm going to come back after this is run, which I'm expecting to take, well, possibly several hours. We'll see. I'll leave it to run and uh, I'll see you guys after the cut. Right, so eight hours later or seven hours and 50 minutes, because uh, this is a pretty high capacity battery. That's one thing that the MacBook Airs are actually rather good at. Um, we have finished our charge cycle. So we actually dropped a little bit of health. We went from um, 5705 down to 5677. However, you can see that after doing that charge cycle, we've updated the battery's internal controller with the current and true capacity of the battery. Um, so this gives us a clearer picture on what state the battery is in. Um, now, on some batteries, if you had, if we had a completely goosed battery, we'd probably see that health actually tank even further. And that would tell us that a battery that was saying that it was air eh, is actually, no, that's not okay. And certainly with some of the other batteries that I tried um, off camera, uh, before, I was, before I started recording the review, a couple of these other ones I did, when I initially checked the health of the battery, just from battery info, it was saying, fair, you know, 30 or 40%. But as soon as you actually did a calibration on it, that health would then tank down to absolutely poor, where we would reveal that after running the test, the battery is actually completely toast. So as I say, the calibration may help, may give you a better or worse result afterwards. But the, more, the most important thing is that it's giving you an up-to-date result, not just simply the last known result that the controller had. We'll go through one more example now. Now, I'm not sure how well this is gonna go, but this is a test that I really am very interested in indeed. I've got here, this is a HP battery. Um, this is a uh, 807956 to be exact. And if we go over to the software, you can see that I've got that dialed into the battery pinout finder here. And that's giving us uh, plus one D3C4 minus eight. I'll go through that slower in a sec. Um, so let's hook up the battery as per those um, specifications. So let's plug this in. Now I'm going to start from, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll always start from ground just because it seems safer to me to get everything plugged in and then plug in the positive pin last. That just seems like a sensible idea to me. So I'm going to start backwards from eight. Now HP batteries are very handily labeled. They've got a plus and a minus on them, which immediately gives away which end is pin one. So uh, the pin 8 is down the end here at the negative, so that is pin 8, then clock 4, so that's the green, and we're going to go 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, uh, data 3, and power 1. Right, so we've got that wired in, and as you can see, we've got no output light. So there's no output light. The battery's not putting out any power. But okay, fine, let's try and read it. So start reading. And we're getting absolutely nothing out of the battery here. So what does this mean? Have I wired it up incorrectly or what? I don't know. So now what I'm gonna do, this is the replacement battery. So the laptop that this battery's come from is actually in the shop for repair at the moment. This was the battery that came out of it, and this is a third-party replacement battery that I purchased by Ninja Bat, that is currently my uh, my brand of choice. Um, so far, I've been buying these Ninja Bat ones on uh, Amazon, and they seem to be pretty good. Quick, the customer's literally connecting, collecting the the laptop now, so I'm going to quickly plug this in and demonstrate. Right, and with the brand new Ninja Bat plugged in, as you can see, we've got output. And if I go to back to the software, start reading, bam. And now we've got data output. So you can see from here that this battery is so stone dead that we can't actually get anything out of it. But the pinout we're using is correct. So let's see if we can recover this battery and make it work at least just enough to get a read on it. So let's hook up the bad battery again. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use the voltage output feature 
and I'm going to feed voltage into the battery to try and back charge the battery and just raise the voltage up to the point where the controller circuitry comes back to life and we can start talking to the battery again. See, it's entirely possible that the battery is completely wrecked and doesn't hold a charge. However, what may have happened is that it may have just been left turned off for too long and the cell voltage has dropped, just dropped down below the point where the controller cannot switch on. So the cells in here might still work, we just need to gently bring the battery back up to the point where the controller turns on and actually allows the battery to charge. Whereas right now, if you try plugging this into a laptop, it's just going to say it can't detect it. So here we go. Right, so I'm going to apply an output power, an output voltage. We're going to apply 6 volts to output. Now I don't know how high we need to put it. The battery is going to be a 4 cell battery I would imagine and it is it's a 11 volt battery. So obviously 6 is half of what it needs to be. But I think the idea here is in theory just to apply just enough just to wake the thing up. So let's just power it on. So now we've got our output light on because there is power at the cell. Now let's try reading again. Nope, so we're not getting anything at the moment. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read the manual. Right, one manual we'll check later. The manual is really good, by the way, and explains anything that you're not sure about here. So according to the manual, um, I am doing this correctly, but I probably need to give it a bit more. The manual specifies that I should try feeding in a voltage that is one or two volts lower than the design voltage of the battery. Now I know from where I plugged in the Ninja battery replacement and read data off of that, that this is actually a 14.6 volt battery because it's a four cell battery. And just for reference on how that's calculated, that's 3.7 times four ish. Um, more about that if you know about battery composition. Um, however, the output voltage for this battery is just shy of 11 volts. So it's doing a little bit of step down in the controller. So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to take the output voltage and go down by 2 volts. So it says it's 11 volts. I'm going to try stepping up my output voltage to 9 volts and see what we get from there. So let's power off and I'm going to set 9 volts, so 9,000 millivolts. Let's try powering on there. So now we're outputting 9 volts into the battery. Let's try and read it again. No, nope, we're still not getting anything there. Oh, hold up, I've got my data and clocks the wrong way round. I plugged this in in a hurry and got it wrong. Data 3, clock 4. I've plugged that in, we've got no output. Let's try it again at uh, 9 volts, so 9,000 millivolts. Power on. And let's just try reading again. Yes, there we go, look at that. We've got static data and start reading dynamic. There we go. So, remaining capacity alarm, 285 milliamps. Okay, so if we read capacity, it's empty, yeah. So the, the battery is stone flat. So now the question is, is can we feed in enough power to get this thing to, to reinvigorate this thing again? So uh, let's see what we can do now to fix this. So battery status, terminate charge alarm, terminate discharge, remaining capacity alarm, initialize discharging, fully discharged. So yeah, there's everything wrong with this battery. There's everything wrong with it. So what we need to do now is see if we can make it charge. I wonder if we can do that. So let's power it off. And right, what if I just try charging? Will it let me do that? No, it doesn't want to do that. I'm going to go back to the original 6,000 milliamps. Power on. And let's just check that we can get data again. Yep. Okay, right. So uh, can we get a charge state? Yeah, so our, our at rate is zero at the moment. 
and it just fell over. Oh, and it's back again. I think it needs more than that. So let's power off. I'm going to give it I'm going to give it the beans again. Let's give it 9 volts. Power on. Quick correction from the editing desk for this section, because I'd actually made quite a grave error while running this experiment. Thankfully, nothing dangerous. However, because the Ninja Bat was a four-cell battery, I completely assumed that the original battery would be as well. But in actual fact, the original one was a three-cell battery, and the Ninja Bat was a four-cell doing internal step-down. And that is actually revealed by the static battery data, which showed that the Ninja Bat had a design voltage of 14 point something. However, the original battery that we've got connected at the moment was 10.9. So there is, you can see that we've actually got a, a cell voltage of difference there. This is also revealed in the software itself where it shows us the cell voltages down at the bottom of the dynamic battery data. This was right in front of me, but I hadn't spotted it while I was recording. So we can use that information there to determine straight away what has occurred here in that uh, cell 1 is fine, cell 3 is fine, but cell 2 is super low. So that's our bad cell in the battery. That's the one that's bringing the entire battery voltage down to the point where the controller will not charge it. Uh, this is more or less unrecoverable at this point. We might be able to bring it back if we leave apply output voltage turned on for a long period of time. And we might be able to just nudge that cell back up to 3 volts and then the battery will probably go ahead and say, yeah, I'll charge that. However, on this particular one, that wasn't happening. So instead, I'm going to move on to another battery that I did have a bit more luck with. So let's catch up where I've just plugged that one in and just managed to activate that with the apply output voltage. Ah, while digging through my spare batteries, looking for another feature to test, I've actually found one where we can, where we might actually be able to recover it. So I've got a battery here. This again, it's another HP battery, almost identical to the last one we looked at. Um, and this one, same deal. As you can see, our output light is off, so we've got no output from the battery. Now, initially, again, when I tried to get a, when I tried to read the data, I think it's going to work for me now because I just powered this up. Yeah, of course it is, but. Uh, initially, I tried to read it, and again, it was stone dead, no reaction at all. However, I applied the I applied the six volts to it. Then I managed to do a read static data, which got me information from the battery, and it told me the design voltage was fourteen point eight. So what I then did, I powered off, and now if I allow higher voltage and we bash in fourteen volts, so fourteen thousand millivolts, power on. Now, if I start reading dynamic data, here's where the interesting bit comes in. Look at the current. We're on 60 milliamps. And if we give that a moment, we should actually find that because that's actually reading a positive current, it means it's actually taking on charge. Oh, it was on like 600 just then. Let's see if it comes back to us. What's the status? Okay, we're currently discharging and we're fully discharged. Okay, well, that's fine. However, we've lit up the battery again. Can I use the charge feature? If I start charging, will it charge for me? Charging the battery. So our battery current is currently at... Oh, there we go, it's climbing. Oh, I'm really frustrated that I wasn't recording. However, this literally worked exactly as intended. And there we go. We're, the current is starting to climb now. I'm really frustrated I wasn't recording just then. The battery was not reading. I applied voltage to it. The controller came online. And now I'm able to charge this battery. So the question is, will it actually charge though? I mean, you'll notice that our current has just dropped down again. And we're... Uh, yeah, we're losing current. Uh, I don't know. You know what? I'm going to leave that to run. And I'm going to see if we can put anything into it. However, from this example, you can see how on this particular battery, we've managed to get a step closer to actually recovering the battery. Whether or not we can recover it to something that's usable or not is another question. Um, however... 
yeah, you see why you see what this device is doing now, because this this brings about an interesting point which I didn't mention earlier on, which is obviously when you're using like Windows or Mac OS, both Windows and Mac OS do have features that will give you battery reports from software, where the the laptop as long as long as the laptop supports it, the operating system can pull the battery and pull this information from it. However, what that doesn't allow you to do is actually do anything with that information. It can tell you the stats of the battery, but you can't change anything or, or give instructions to the laptop to do anything. You can't tell it to forcibly charge the battery or anything like that. Whereas with the battery analyzer, we can. And that might be the difference. You know, this battery might be in reasonable health it's just been overly discharged where the battery was flat and then it was put in a cupboard for six months. However, if we actually manage to get a charge into this battery, you know, it's holding at about 200 milliamps at the moment. If we can actually get power into this battery, then we may end up with something that's actually usable. Ah, I paused for a minute because I was going to walk away. But look, just as I paused, our current is climbing drastically. Where the battery is starting to wake up, it's actually really starting to ramp up now. Our voltage is starting to soar. So it looks like what's happened is we've trickle charged the battery just to get the minimum voltage up. And now we're actually ramping up to a proper charge cycle and the current is ramping up. So I've currently got this set to a maximum charging current of two amps. So that's not gonna go over two amps. Um, however, that looks like it's gonna ramp all the way up to that two amp limit and actually start banging some charge into this thing now. This is really cool. This is a really good example. This battery was stone dead, could not, did not respond at all. And now we've actually got something that is actually responsive and maybe even working. So let's leave it to run. And I'm going to go back to the information now. And firstly, we're going to run another read on it. And so now what we can see from here, uh, we can see that we our current is now at minus 16 milliamps. So the status is now discharging. However, obviously it's discharging at such a small rate that it's negligible. The important thing is, is that with the output voltage turned off, we still have an output light on the front of the unit. So now we can see that the battery is now self-powered, which is what we were trying to achieve. We've got enough power into this battery that it has now actually woken up and can power itself. So this is good. Um, so now we can start paying attention to the other stuff. So firstly, we can see that the cycle count on this is actually very low. It's only 109. So theoretically, this is possibly a contender for a battery that's worth trying to recover. So let's try and get some other information. So read capacity, we should get 23. Yeah, so we're at 24% near enough. What do we reckon the health is? So the health is apparently at about, is at 55%, which is, you know, that's a bit knackered, but I don't know, that might well be usable. So uh, let's go over to the calibrate and let's clear the log. Okay, so we're back after calibration and we have lost capacity through the calibration. But again, this is not so much that we are damaging the battery or anything like that. What we're doing is revealing its true state. Um, because the problem is, is that when this battery is plugged into a laptop and the battery and the laptop is discharging the battery, it's going to take the capacity before, in this case 1534, it's going to use that as the capacity of the battery. And it's going to take a, a full charge will be 100% of that. Now, if that's not the true capacity in the battery, in this case, the true capacity at the moment is 1126 milliamp hours. When this battery reaches like, I don't know, what, 20%? Someone do the maths on that. When it gets down to like 20%, there's going to be nothing left. The battery thinks there's power left, but there isn't. So the laptop would drop down to say 20% and then just cut out. And this is what happens with phones and laptops where people go, oh, it got down to, it got down to like 40% and then died because the battery thinks it has more capacity than it really does. Whereas now we've calibrated it, yes, we have lost capacity, but what's actually happened is we've updated the battery's controller with the true capacity that's left in the battery. And so now when this runs, yeah, it's not gonna run for very long. However, the percentage 
reading of the battery will actually give us a true indication of how much the battery has. And then in addition to that, in the case of this battery, we went from a battery that was actually completely dead and non-functional. And now we have a battery that is not very good, but not very good is an improvement over completely non-functional. So of course, a decent person might at this point turn around and go, why don't you just replace the battery? And that's true. In my case, um, I, I wouldn't go through the trouble of doing all of this on every battery that comes into the shop unless I had a reason to, um, you know, a, a replacement battery for this one is about £30 on Amazon. So that's, I don't know what, um, 35 to $35, $37 or something like that. So it's a case of you just, just replace the battery. Um, however, if you've got an old one and you really want to make that battery work, then absolutely. The, va the usefulness of the battery analyzer, I think, is m better for batteries that are actually in good condition, but for some reason or other are not functional. Um, or as I've said earlier on in this video, where you have either a brand new battery or you have a modern laptop that is liquid damaged and the battery is not talking and you need to find out why. Um, this battery is too old to be useful. However, if we had a modern battery that had just been deep de that had just been deep deep discharged because of some kind of fault, we could potentially recover it back into a very healthy state. And that's something that the laptop cannot actually do itself. We might be able to get a read of all these statistics through Windows or through MacOS, but we can't do anything with that information. So with all that said, I want to give a big thank you to NIP Embedded Systems for sending me this example of their professional laptop battery analyzer. This is a very unique piece of equipment, um, which has, as far as I can tell, no real competitors in the market space at all. And for someone who is dealing with lots of laptop repairs, including battery uh, analysis for um, liquid damaged laptops, liquid damaged batteries, and so on, or just worn batteries, this is very, very unique and could be incredibly powerful. It's currently available on the website, which I will link in down below. They have stock as of the recording of this video and they ship worldwide. So thanks a lot for watching. I hope you found this one interesting. Uh, all of my support links are also in the description down below and they'll be on the end card that you'll see in a minute, including my Discord server and my Patreon. Thank you very much, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.